Welcome back to the eSpurs podcast. I think it's fair to say none of us expected to be back so soon this summer. We've squeezed in an extra show for you this week, guys. Um, due to the fact that the, the middle of last week, Daniel Levy uh, started throwing out announcements left, right and centre. Busy week for Spurs as always, hence the extra podcast that we're, we're doing for you tonight. And for once... I can't see there being a negative word said on the podcast tonight. It should be a, a very interesting chat. And as always, we've got um, the eSports team for you. We've got AD, John, Mark and David. How are you doing, fellas? Good. I've good, good. got my ammo saved up from last week for AD, so there will be some negative things said on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you have the right reply, Mark. You had the right reply. <laughs> um, so before we get into the Spurs chat this week, let's um, go over to Coatsy. I know, Coatsy, there's something you'd like to, to mention on the show. Yeah, it's just a quick one, Andy. Um, it's one of the Legends nights. And for me, this one is a, a real kind of special one. It's an evening with Keith Birkinshaw. And Peter Shreves. It's in Chessington in Surrey, um, Friday the 18th of September. It's been organised by Darren Sheen. Tickets are £25, and you can contact Darren via Twitter at, at Chesspur. What I will do um, after this podcast tonight, I'll send out the actual link and, and the details for it. But Keith Birkinshaw's getting to an age now. I think he's just turned 80. So um, the opportunity to hear some of his stories are. I'm getting smaller, so to speak. So um, that should be a really good night out. Yeah, absolutely, Coatsy. What a night that would be. Um, in, in many people's eyes, our second greatest manager of all time, um, Birkinshaw, of course, the 84 night will live long in every Spurs fan's memory. So well worth um, a ticket if you can get to that one. I'd love to get to one of these Legends nights, Coatsy. I haven't been to one myself. I know you went to, to one recently. Yeah, Steve Perryman. They are, they are a great night and there's kind of a group of people who kind of organise them. You've got the Spurs Poet, you've got Darren, you've got Lorraine Bergstrom, you know, you've got guys up in in Gloucester. And then in general, you've got Crackers who does the hosting. Um, so it is a good night. And it's 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 great because I really can't see some of the, the modern day players doing this in 20 years time. So I think it's an opportunity for every Spurs fan of all age groups to, to go and see some of the Spurs legends and find out what football was like in the real days. Yeah, great shout, Coach. And as, as we just mentioned, we'll put the link out on the East Spurs Twitter at E underscore Spurs straight after the show. Listen, lads, <laughs> busy week, as I say. It's a, a very, very exciting week for, for Spurs because of the announcements. We all knew that there were some announcements due, but they seem to keep rolling on Wednesday thick and fast and the most exciting of all was that we finally of course got some news on this brand new stadium that we're all hoping for and expecting to take us to the next level. Before we go through the details, Coatsy, first of all, this this scheme hugely, hugely important to to Tottenham and us moving forward and, and competing with other other clubs. Yeah, it's essential. Um, if you look at what Hart Lane now it, it's just not a as much as I I love the stadium. If you if you go and sit in some areas of the ground, it's you, you can see how how really old it is, um, especially the shelf up. Uh, I sat there a couple of seasons ago, and it's it's not the greatest. It's very tight, um, but obviously for revenues we need it. Um, so I think you can talk about. Listen, I think we should have done this earlier, but for me, it's a. I've just kind of blocked that all out now. You know, we've. I think we've spoke on the podcast a lot about what what should have happened, what didn't happen. Um, but for me, the announcement on on Wednesday, um, I think it was Wednesday, was just basically about moving forward. And there's two things really that have got me um, kind of infused even more is the fact that the capacity is larger than what we first thought. And also the signs about going to Wembley seem to be more um, positive than they were last week. Yeah, they certainly do. And what we'll try and do for everybody, I guess, guys, is try and break it down into sections tonight because there are so many um, bits and pieces from the announcement to go through including as Coates has just mentioned there the the possibility of Wembley the club have now announced that Wembley is their favoured favoured option um, the the increased capacity up to 61,000 so a couple of hundred above that lot down the road which is which is nice um, the NFL the extra new homes on off-site housing AD anything in particular from from the announcement Wednesday that stands out for you? I think it all stands out. I think we were um, critical of Daniel Levy in regards to um, keeping the fans 
in touch with what was going on. Um, not enough was coming out. We weren't hearing any news. And then on Wednesday, it was just like, wow. Um, I think it's absolutely massive. Um, and the the stadium itself uh, is just going to be unbelievable. And what Daniel Neves managed to do with the NFL tie-up is also unique and I can see why he probably didn't come out with more information because it could have jeopardised I think there's other clubs that maybe would have wanted to jump on this I think that what it will do for Tottenham as a football club is um, absolutely immense it's going to catapult us in revenue terms and that would be just you know standard revenues of of, of match day for for an example but then when you add the NFL sponsorship into it um, sorry the NFL deal and then the sponsorship, which is going to not only come from um, UK-based companies, it's going to come from worldwide companies because obviously the NFL and, and, and football is the two biggest sports in the world. So I think it's huge. I think we've got to um, give him unbelievable amounts of credit. I agree with Coatsy. I think it's taking too long, but we've got to let that go now because what he's presented us with is, is nothing short of sensational. Yes, it's one of the most exciting announcements I can remember in, in a few years. Mark, I guess we should come to you on this one, um, being over in Chicago there. The NFL deal, huge, we know. How is it being viewed over there and how big can you see this being for Spurs? I think it, we're definitely noticing it here. I mean, on news sites, it was kind of a, a breaking news story, but no one really went too in-depth with it. Um, no one's really sure what to expect from the NFL playing games overseas. Um, obviously, it's kind of been done on a, an experimental basis over the last few years. But I don't know, as, as per- personally as a fan, if the Eagles played, you know, one of their eight dedicated home games over in London, it, it probably pissed me off, to be honest, if I'm a season ticket holder and they're taking one of my games overseas. So um, I think the NFL as business likes it and, and the American fan who appreciates, you know, how rich the leagues are and, and the, the things they're able to provide, the experiences. Um, but as a fan, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone would really like it. It's, I guess it's a tricky balance, isn't it, for, uh, for the NFL to try and get between enhancing the brand and, and, and going global and also keeping people at home happy. So it's a... Yeah, it, imagine if the Spurs played a, a regular season match in, in Chicago. Yeah. So it's a tricky old balance to get. Um, I know, obviously, we've seen the games at Wembley sell out pretty much every game um, within within hours. So the demand's there. And the, the the most exciting thing for me about this this announcement is that once we, we have the NFL at, at, at Spurs, the, the new stadium goes from just being the, the stadium of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club to becoming a, a landmark, you know, and... and it, it, it takes Spurs up to that that next level. It's interesting, AD mentioned there that there are possibility of other games being played at other stadiums. They left that option open, didn't they, in the announcement? And um, I, I just wonder whether or not Spurs are being put on probation slightly by the NFL with a view to maybe one day having that that permanent team based in, in, in London and just seeing how it goes to begin with. Um, we There was rumours it might be a... A, um, a team moving into to, to White Hart Lane straight away, but it was the announcement came and it was just the two games per season, wasn't it? So it'd be interesting to see what developments there are after that. Ten years, um, two games a season. Arguably, you can say there'd probably be more played there than that. Um, great for the local area, great for the, uh, the the club. Exciting times. John, over in Barbados, it's, it's going to be, as I say, a, a step up for the club in, in every single way. You're, you're um, from the local area. You're from North London, like myself, from very close to where the, the stadium um, will be built. How important is this to, to Tottenham as an area? Oh, it's going to do wonders. I had sent a few messages to, to the guys when it came out. Um, the economy needed it badly. So I, I think that there's everything positive that's going to come from it. You, you know, it would be job creation. It's just going to be a, a whole boost for the economy. And it is a much needed facelift as well. So there's all plus points, I, I think, for um, for what's going to happen. It, it, it couldn't come in a moment sooner, it should have come in just the time. Yeah, it certainly does. It's, um, it's Tottenham, as you say, even as a, a resident of Tottenham, it's probably not the area you'd, you'd go to on a non-match day, is it? Um, if, you're a, if you're visiting <laughs> North London. And it'd be great to see it improved. It'd be great to see it brought up to standard. Fantastic stuff. 
what I did see, which was very interesting, talking about the two games this season for the 10 years, uh, there was an interview with Daniel Levy where he s- said um, explicitly that the NFL had been involved in the designs of the new stadium. And to me, that means that the press release is a little bit um, blasé in, in regards of what they actually want to do. I think it's pretty certain that if there was going to be a, a London-based NFL franchise, that it would be based at Tottenham Hotspur. I don't think that they would have taken the time to get involved with designs and stuff like that if it was just going to be for two games um, over the 10 years, hence the word minimum. I, I, I think that it's they're just entering it. They're trying to... They're trying to make it look like it's not an explicit deal with Spurs, but I think you'll probably find it will be. Yeah, it's it's an inter- you know great point you make in a fra- in a franchise in a franchise you know in a franchise sort of thing. Obviously, there'll be other games played all over the United Kingdom possibly, but what I'm saying is when it comes to a franchise, I think that us allowing them to get involved in the designs of the stadium points to the fact that if there is a franchise, it's gonna be at Tottenham. I would say. Yeah, it's interesting. Great point, AD. And and obviously the announcement was made with Spurs first. So, you know, as you say, you, you would think that we'd be first in line for that that franchise, fingers crossed. And, um, you know, hoping that everything goes smoothly from, from here on in. One of the announcements that was part of the NFL um, agreement or design, Coatsy, was the this amazing retractable pitch which is going to be part of the new stadium design there's been rumors about that also haven't there for, for months now but it was all confirmed um and listen i'm a spurs fan but I've, you know you've got to say compared to the emirates this place is going to wipe the floor with with that lot down the road isn't it yeah well it, it would do really or you'd expect it to which is why i was so um despondent with the original attendance um of about 56 57 i think we were looking at maybe a little bit more um, because obviously as time goes on, um, stadiums should progress. Um, I think the NFL deal has taken this on to a, a new scale. It's almost, it's kind of future proof in the, the, the future of Spurs almost really in terms of partnership with the NFL. I think the NFL are, are kind of serious about a London based team. Um, I agree with Mark. And being an NFL fan myself, I love the Bears. I have done for for a number of years since I was a kid in the eighties, and it it is very difficult um, for fans over there to accept that they are going to have to go to London, especially when they only get a certain amount of games a year. It's not very many. So if you kind of pick one out of our nineteen or or twenty one, if you include cut games, to kind of go somewhere else, it would be very different to to a guy who's kind of paid for his season ticket. An NFL team, so I think that's short term. I think the big picture is is for a franchise to be in London. I think, as you said earlier, I think you touched on it in terms of how popular the sport is over here. It's just immense, um, and I think the NFL want to build on that. And all, also, the retractable pitch really kind of allays your fears of of what Spurs would be playing on. So it's going to be a, a very modern stadium with, with every angle covered. Yeah, it's um, it, I mean, we've got one of the best groundsmen in the country, and we Darren Baldwin down there does a fantastic job. Um, even towards the end of each season, it still looks like a carpet, doesn't it? It's, so you you can you can believe that it's it's going to be fantastic in the new stadium with the technology that be but be about by the time it's built there, guys. The just reading up on the um, timeline, the club also. Thank goodness, at long last, put out a timeline just to give us a bit of an idea of of when things might be ready by. They 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 reckon late. 2015 the planning application will be considered by um, the GLA the Great London Authority and spring 16 2016 they hope to start work on the revised scheme mark it's all coming together nicely we've seen the the um, plan we've seen the the overhead view of the of the site so it's all work has started on the site as we know and and the club are now i suppose under a little bit of pressure now aren't they to stick to this this schedule with with the NFL deal in place and and also the the prospect now they've announced the club that the the preferred option for a stadium move for a season is is now Wembley yeah i think it's very difficult to to set a, a hard deadline but i think the allotted time is more than enough to get the the job done i think uh, you know levy levy was very um, cautious in the interview of saying that's the schedule and things tend to to go off schedule, but we hope that it's it's all done by this date. 
regarding the, the second point, I mean, it's rumored that Chelsea also want to uh, either redesign Stamford Bridge or um, I, I guess that's really their only option is to redesign, and they also want to play in Wembley. So that's an interesting scenario where you know they've obviously have much deeper pockets. They're able to out outpay to use the stadium. That's the process. Um, it'll be interesting to see if, if we get chosen over them. I think it's – I'm not optimistic that happening. It seems like uh, – one of those scenarios where we're trying, we're trying, and it, it just doesn't look like it would it would be likely to to take us over Roman and his his billions. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it, that Chelsea put their plans in straight away were linked with Wembley, even though we've been looking at that option for for months and months now. You would think Spurs then confirmed they came out the next day and confirmed straight away that the club that we're also in discussions with with Wembley, as you would expect, and um, be interesting to see who gets it. One thing I I didn't know before, but I I found out this week via. Um, one of the Spurs sites was that there's obviously a cap on the number of events that can be played at Wembley, but under a certain number, I think it's around the 50, 53, the guys might be able to help me out, 53, 55,000 mark, um, that cap goes. So you could therefore um, possibly see both Chelsea and Spurs sharing Wembley for a season. AD, would that work? Um, I think that's what will happen, to be honest. Um, I think the pressure on the FA... Um, in regards to this is going to be immense because not only have you got Tottenham Hotspur, you've got Chelsea as well. Both massive clubs, both well-supported um, in London and both would be offering to pay ground rent. So I think that that's exactly what will happen. You'll see the uh, tenants is capped at, I, th- I think it's 50,000 um, and you'll see uh, Tottenham Hotspur and Chelsea probably alternate. Although I, I can't see, I think Chelsea might be slightly behind because obviously they haven't even released any designs yet or anything like that. So you may find that we, we are in there the, a year before Chelsea anyway. But I think that it would definitely be a case of the FA. They couldn't say yes to one and, and no to another. I think it will be a situation where it will either be no to both or yes to both. And it will probably be on a, a one-week Tottenham, one-week Chelsea basis, which is perfectly good. They, they could reap loads of benefits financially from that. Um, rent fees from Chelsea and Spurs, massive um, attendances every week. Um, and, and, you know, and it would easily accommodate 50,000. People would go through there like ants. It'd be no problem at all. Yeah, it'd be, be fantastic. And as you say, they work for all parties, isn't it? Because the FA are getting money in, Spurs and, and Chelsea fans are kept happy. It just seems to, to work around. Coatsy, the, the Spurs, the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust, um, were involved in, in this one. We've questioned their role on the show a few times, but they seem to have done a good job on this one. A good job about Wembley. Yeah, I mean, they, they you know, put out the, 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 the fan surveys and they also have, have written the open letter to the FA, haven't they? And, and they seem to have, have, have pushed the club on, on the Wembley option. Yeah, from what, from what I can see, yeah. Um, I think they've done their own survey um, before the club and then the club followed. It's not going to be clear cut about getting Wembley. Um, for me, it's a no-brainer as well. Um, obviously, there'd be policing issues. Um, there's going to be travel issues um, that obviously is going to have to take a lot of parties getting getting around the table. What happens on midweek games? Um, you know, if, if we're both in Europe, um, playing twice a week constantly, and Brent Council having been born and bred in the council, I know that they're. Um, quite difficult to deal with. Um, I think Chelsea have come out straight away because I think they feel if they just throw the millions at it, they'll get it. But it's going to be interesting. I'm still kind of wondering how much of a consideration Milton Keynes is. But you've got to take the club at face value. You know, I I, I honestly feel that, and I always have done, that there's a deal to be done with the FA and the local council around Wembley. And a lot of that was around the, the actual reduction in attendance. Now, Chelsea coming into play will confuse things and may make it a bit more difficult. Um, and that's where you kind of get a little bit frustrated about our delay. But AD's right. You know, Chelsea haven't really done too much along the lines of designs, etc. They are going to be highly hampered because they've got a railway line right in the vicinity of the ground. So their planning is going to have to be delicate. Um, obviously, because... Network Rail ain't going to just move that that railway line. So I I tend to think, the majority of me tends to think, 
that we'll probably be in and out, hopefully, before Chelsea get in. But let's wait and see. I think we've we've kind of been been hit by delays um, so much. I just think it's having an open mind and not being and just having that bit of caution. Yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, any progress is better than none. And um, we've been calling for some progress for a long time now. So just to to hear what we've heard this week is, is you know, seems to be great news anyway. Another another thing that interestingly stands out to me is this um, 80s, this, this Skywalk. Um, I can see that being interesting after a few pints in the bricklayers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i tell you what, it's, it's innovative, i tell you that, it, it, it does look absolutely fantastic, I mean, um, you know, some of the things that are going to be in, in this ground, including what I was really happy about was the museum, I think the museum's really important, it was in original designs and then the second lot of designs that in 2007, the second lot of designs, they didn't point too much towards the museum being in there, um, now you've got the museum in there, there's going to be a, an area that's bigger than Trafalgar Square, there's going to be rock climbing up, up one side of the buildings. There's going to be all kinds of things. And I think it it kind of um, points to a match day being, um, you know, not just about watching the football. Um, I went to watch Barcelona a few times a, a few years back and they had, you know, different, uh, they, they had like Brazil, a, a Portuguese food uh, day and they had uh, Brazilian dancers there and there was rock climbing there and there was a carnival there. Hang on, hang, hang like, on, AD, um, I'm just trying to clear my clear my mind of an image with you with maracas and, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what I mean? It was brilliant. It was it was an event. We went there three or four hours early. We were we were drinking outside. We were, you know, having a uh, uh, stare at the old Brazilian dancers, female ones, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, do you know what I mean? It, you can imagine it, and it was fantastic. And then we went in and we watched the game, and it was just a brilliant day out. So I think that's what Tottenham are trying to do. They're going to make it. It's not just about the match, the hour and a half. Some people get there just before kickoff and just get to their seats really quickly. They don't want that. They want people there, and they want people spending money. And I think I think that's going to happen. Yeah, it's um a, a whole um experience, isn't it? As you say, not just about the football now. It's about changing that that mentality I, I was going on about just now about not going to the area of Tottenham unless it's a match day, um, because there's nothing there. But now there will be. It's about getting bringing people into the area of Tottenham, which is great, great all round. Um, you would think. And just finally on the um the subject of the new stadium, Coatsy. You never expect um, Arsenal fans to be chuffed at any Spurs news. What did you make of the the reaction of the uh, that lot down the road this week? Well, to be honest with you, what I kind of friends of mine were just like, well, listen, it's a lovely stadium, you know, it's about time you got one. And I think the rest of them were kind of like, well, listen, a stadium doesn't make a team, obviously. And, and when was the last time we got fourth, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, <laughs> listen, it was a good bit of banter, anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, always makes for some some good banter. I tell you another thing I really like about the new stadium. When I first saw the pictures on Wednesday, was that there's a it's a, it's slightly different to the designs we saw of the old stadium. The old stadium, sorry, the the first designs of the new stadium were very much like the new Wembley, weren't they? Or the Emirates, very generic in design. I think they were designed by the same people, so you'd expect that. But this new stadium, it, it's very different in, in the look. Um, the roof's um, different. The the inside, you've got those um, straight stands, very narrow to the pitch. Um, nothing like the new Wembley, which is, you know, sort of, it's a lovely stadium, but it, it's you feel as if you're you're miles away from the pitch if you're sitting in the, the top of the, the upper tier. Um it looks fantastic. It looks like a million miles away from the Emirates, a million miles away from Wembley, which I think is important. We need our own identity, don't we? And I was worried that those first designs that we saw of the new stadium, it looked very similar to, you know, it looked almost a blue and white version of the Emirates or or, or, or Wembley. And, um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm chuffed that we've, we seem to have got our own place, um, our own designs for the stadium, which I, I guess is down to the new um, the new. Uh, company design in the stadium so fantastic stuff there listen guys we've got to move on to there was <laughs> Wednesday was a very busy day um another announcement that, that happened on Wednesday which was finally we we made the signing of AD do you want to pronounce that one for me mate Aldi Willy the Willy Aldi 
Well, well, that's that's the one. Whatever he said, um, <laughs> he's uh, Toby <laughs> Alderweir ruled. I I presume something like that. Listen, we signed this guy. We we finally got over um the, the finishing line with the deal. Southampton threatened legal action, then dropped it. Um, Mark, we've got um. I know. <laughs> listen, Mark's been chomping at the bit to get into the transfer news tonight for for everybody listening out there. So we're gonna let him off the leash now, Mark. Um, this one was rumoured for a long time. We've, we've got a bit of history, haven't we, in, in pissing Southampton off with transfers? Yeah, it, it, you know, I missed this part of the podcast last week watching the, the U.S. women win the World Cup. So I've, I've had two weeks worth of, of rumours and, and chat built up. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it says it all. AD was, was saying the whole week prior, well, if the player wants Spurs over Southampton, then what can Southampton do? They can sue, they can, you know, threaten all this legal action. But if he doesn't want to sign for them, then what's what's the point? Um, and it was it was made very clear. Les Reed, their their footballing director, said um, that's exactly why they're not pursuing legal action anymore. Is because the player said, um, you know, he wanted to to go to Spurs and there was nothing they could do about it. So I think it's a very good signing. It's not, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the signings we're making this summer are signings to um, create a better team. So while the players are, are not you know, top world-class players, they do make the team better. Toby, um, you would think, would help bring out the best in, in Jan. He's also someone who fits the, the high-pressing system uh, very well. He's comfortable with the ball at his feet. Um, so you could see the two of them being a very uh, progressive, modern um, technical center back pairing and are there better center backs that we could have yeah but for 11 million or 11 and a half million whatever we were you know reported to pay someone who knows our other center back very well and allows us to play the system we want to play I think it's a fantastic signing um, and I think there's one or two more impact signings that are of similar cut that will allow us to play our system and and uh, we'll, we'll see the team hopefully take steps forward just because there's more of um, you know, players fitting the profile of, of what we look for in each position this year. Um, so I think it was a, a very strong signing and hopefully, uh, you know, the type of signing we're going to make a few more of this summer. Absolutely. Um, John, another defensive signing. The club seemed to have focused mainly on that area, which was a weakness. We all mentioned it at the, the end of last season. Are we now set to go in defence? Do you think? Yeah, I, I can't. I can't see um, no additions. I just think that the some of what was there last year will move out, and I, I think it'll probably be a centre midfield or a defensive midfielder and a striker, and that be it. I, I think there'll probably only be two signings. The, the the thing is with the money we've been bringing in, I really would like a marquee sign. I really would like a top top player to come in, but. With what's going on and what's being achieved, I, I won't actually hold my hand up and moan if we go mid-range as we're likely to, rather than you know go 30 million or 25 million and get a real box office draw. I, I'll, I'll, I'm content, and um, what's been happening is, is really like lifted my spirits a lot. So I won't be hypocritical if we do what you'd call a safe signing, and I, I figure we'll do safe. I don't think we're gonna really push the boat out for anything about 25 million. I doubt it. I think so. I'm happy with the defence. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And I think so. It's, it's been steady progress, hasn't it? I think we'll call it this this summer um, with, with the new defenders coming in. And and previous to the the uh, signing of Toby, I think it was um, it was quite underwhelming, wasn't it? We mentioned on the show last week that the transfer business, but now we've got him in. There seems to be some ambition there, albeit you know not the biggest signing in the world. But things seem to be moving in the right direction. Ad, with with this guy coming in now, we all know he's long term friends with with uh, Vertonghen, played with him um, at, at Ajax, and and uh, do you see them be, be, with having the potential to become the best partnership in in the Premier League? These two? Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. I think it's important. I tell you what, I do think is important is that. Um, not it's not always the best defenders that um, make the best partnerships. I think if you look at as an example Terry and Cahill, um, you know I don't I don't think that uh, Cahill's the best uh, centre back out there, but he complements John Terry very very well and, and they work really well and I think that this is exactly what could happen 
um, without a Weirald and Vertonghen because they're, they're used to playing together. Um, and I think they can just fit in and slip in nicely into the same old groove that they had at Ajax and, and they've had at Belgium. Um, I know Vertonghen plays left back quite a lot for Belgium, but he has, they have played together a set of half. So I think it is a uh, an astute signing. You've got a guy that's already had a season in the Premiership, so there's no real worries about whether he will fit in because he knows the way the Premiership is and, and he did fit in very well last year. He's not um, he's not the best defender in the world. Um, I think people, some people might be disappointed with what they do see from him on as an individual, because a lot of people go by, oh yeah, you know, let's get this guy in. He's got to be good. He's got to be good. He is good, but he's not. He's not brilliant. He's a very solid, um, all-round um, centre back, and he's probably better than what we've got, but. Most importantly, he will make uh, a really good partnership, I think. I think Dyer is probably better than him, um, or will be better than him in his all-round game, but I don't think that Dyer and Vertonghen are quite on the same wavelength. And I think maybe that's what the clubs looked at. And you've got to compliment them for that, because you know it's important. Our back four is important. Now we need to move on to protecting it. Yeah. Coatsy, am I, am I wrong in thinking that maybe we need a bit of a a bit of a bruiser in there, maybe, in defence, a bit of a John Terry-like player. Yeah, I think for most fans, um, and we've spoke about it a lot, the next position really to focus on, I agree with John, I think we've we've done now three buys on the defence, so it's more about getting the surplus out. We definitely need a, a solid defensive midfielder who is going to be there to protect. I think we've, we've all spoke about the defence, um, we've all got different views on it, but I think what we do agree on is that it needs more protection yeah absolutely we've got you know behind it fantastic we've got one of the best goalkeepers in the world it looks you know i don't want to tempt fate here guys but it looks like things might be okay on the uh, transfer front with, with larice so you know um having said that by the next podcast no doubt he'll be gone and playing in a man united shirt um but and, and this is this is the right time to stir the pot a little bit right to talk about the different center midfield options being discussed because I know there's a variety of opinions on that. Well, on yeah. this, uh, I mean, Mark, podcast. on that subject, what 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 do you think we need going forward? All right, here's AD Prepare. There are a few different options that I've, uh, I think are strong options. Um, obviously, I will sing Jordi Clossy's praises until, you know, the, the roosters come home to roast. And it looks like he's going to go to Southampton and replace Schneider Linen. I think he's going to be a fantastic player. Um I think the, the latest rumors with James McCarthy are actually pretty productive because much like Alder Vereld, he may not be the best central midfield in the world, but he fits the role of, of what we need right now, playing next to Bentaleb or playing next to Mason. He's a, a, a more tough def- uh, central midfielder than anyone else we have right now. Um, and he, he does possess some passing ability and he doesn't, you know, tend to play the long ball very often. I think I, I saw his average passing distance is about 20 meters or so. So he he's a tidy player who who keeps the play moving and and uh, you know contributes by picking the right pass at the right time. So I think he's a, a very viable, strong option, especially considering the other players on our roster. That's uh, a problem that you know Spurs have have had with us fans for the last few years. Is there's very clear, obvious players who were supposed to be rumored in, and we make these superficial efforts to sign them. And then, it, I don't know if it's meant to appease the fan base, that, that it's public that we're making these moves or not, but when you offer $10 million last summer for Morgan Schneiderlin, it's embarrassing. And then when we look at next summer and, and see a, a midfield-sized hole that you know, a Schneiderlin or a, a McCarthy fills, then... You know what's the point of of slapping in those those bullshit offers? So I think those those three players, a Klassy, a McCarthy, or Schneiderlin, would all fit very well. They're three different price ranges. They're three different views of 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 a, a player. Klassy being a, a Dutch international has only played in Holland. McCarthy has Premier League experience. Absolutely, I I just doubt. I agree with you on on the players there. I think they'd all be great additions to the side. I just doubt whether or not. Um, in response to Sam's comment there, I, I doubt whether or not we pushed the boat out for anybody this year, bearing in mind um, the club was stung a few years back. Um, 
I, I, I would love to see them push the boat out and go for what we called last week on the podcast, that marquee signing, you know, the, 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 the Klinsman, the Ardelas, um, those, those signings that down the years, every now and again, Tottenham spring up and make. But I just, I just at the moment, AD, I, I, I struggle to see, especially with the new stadium, that the club will, will do anything like that at the moment. Um, I don't know. I think that maybe what we've seen in, in with the buys we've had so far is uh, good management. I think we're going to get we're going to get rid of a lot more players than we buy, and I think that there is room for a big signing. A big signing being big in the manager's eyes. So I think that the way we're moving players out and the people that we're bringing in, we are creating a, a, an opportunity to get one big player in. Now, personally, I would go for a striker. But having said, having seen, talked about in, in previous weeks of the way we play, it's not going to be easy to get a big money striker to come in and play probably second fiddle or think he's going to be second fiddle to um, to Harry Kane. But what intrigues me, what Mark, Mark said, is you've got a player like Jordi Classy who is going to be a fraction of the price and it, it's already a better player in my mind. So I, I just think it's difficult to... We do it in England a lot. Fads. We go for fads. We go for players that are, have one good season, and all of a sudden we think, yeah, they're the next best thing. We've got to go and get them. Well, listen, AD, be Raheem careful. Sterling being case in point oh, today. Absolutely unbelievable. And we've got to be a little bit careful with Harry Kane. We've got to be a little bit, you know, calm with the way we go about raising up Harry Kane to be this, you know, this god, because we don't know how he's going to perform next year. We don't know that. You know, that's just a fact. So, I think it's important that we get that the fact is this, right? If you're going to back a manager, if you're going to keep a manager in charge, we know from past when when a manager wants a player, you have to give him that player because if you don't, it creates all kinds of of uh, bad mouthing that goes on towards the end of a manager's reign where they blame the chairman, they blame the club, they didn't get this, they didn't get that. Um, Moutinho was the biggest mistake the club has made in a long, long time. The you, manager. Know what, you know what, Adi, and... and I, I'd like to open it up and see what everyone else thinks about this because obviously I've been a, a pretty diehard Spurs fan for for a few, years, but you guys have have lifetimes of seeing this. All of last season, what's the the biggest moan that people have each week? Our central midfield week, um, you know, Mason and Bentaleb uh, can't hold up against elite midfields, and then all of a sudden we're being linked with all these players who are clear improvements. And I'm not saying this as as a a diss to Ryan Mason. Ryan Mason can be a very valuable squad player who can start here and there and cup games and, and league games and, and do perfectly fine. I mean, he, he has a role to play. But now all of a sudden we're being linked with McCarthy and we're being linked with these midfielders who are clear improvements over Ryan Mason, especially when you're discussing him them pairing next to Bentaleb. And all of a sudden Ryan Mason is the next thing Luka Modric. Have you, I, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but... All of a sudden, we're talking about bringing in improvements, and people are talking about Ryan Mason as if he did no wrong. And all of last year, we weren't talking about you know playing against United midfield or Chelsea midfield and saying, "Are we need someone elite there?" It's it's the most frustrating thing in the world that people clamor for new signings, new signings, new signings, but then they they don't think that they're an improvement. It, all of a sudden, Nasser Chadley is the best left left uh, attacking mid in in the Premier League, and it it, it fires me up to no end that. As we're actually making moves to improve the club, people think what we had was somehow um, was better, and a player like McCarthy wouldn't be an improvement over Mason. I think, I think it's about the role, Mark. Yeah, it's about the role. And to be honest with you, the people that I follow and who follow me, I haven't really felt that about Mason in terms of some of the names that've been bounded about. That there's no one in particular that that I converse with are are basically putting a massive um, case forward for Mason to be that defensive midfielder. If anything, it's what I said on the pod last week, is he's actually, for me, would do more of a better job further up. For me, Ryan Mason isn't a defensive midfielder. Um, he, he hasn't got that ability, I don't think, to do that role. He's more forward-thinking than that. Um, now, if you're talking about other players around James McCarthy, yeah, I think he's decent. Um, do you think that someone like James McCarthy would take us to the next level? I'm not convinced he would. The question, I, I, I don't get the sense that... Listen, I think when anyone comes up through the ranks, there's always going to be this this kind of fog around them, you know, because Spurs fans have always been quite desperate to see 
players come up through. And in, in reality, we had Ledley for a long time and no one else. So obviously, I think they get a little bit more kudos when they do come up. And I do think that he was overpraised last year at times. And I think we've been quite vocal about it on here. I think the viewing that, that we've seen of Mason has been quite fair in terms of his passing isn't as accurate as it could be. He gives 100%. He gets around the pitch. And when the tempo's right, he's he's an excellent player as a squad player. Would he be on my team sheet for the first 11? No, because I'd rather have a decent defensive midfielder. But it's interesting. I, I think I agree to a certain extent, Mark, in terms of, yeah, people want signings and then they... They kind of want the the players that you have got, but it hasn't been as as big as what what you're experiencing. I'll tell you what I find really interesting, lads. If I can just interject a second, is is for me there's there's two ways to skin a cat, and everyone's talking about this need for a defensive midfielder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, we had Sandro who did that job when he was fit, um, and he did it well. We even had uh, Palacios come in um, under Harry Redknapp, and uh, before all the stuff happened with his brother and his career obviously went down the hill. He, he was really good and he did very well. But you know what's more interesting for me is the best that we've had, the best we've had was Modric and Huddlestone and neither of those are a defensive mid- midfielder and that's why I thought that Kabayi and Bentaleb would have been unbelievable because there's defending as in being strong, tackling, winning the ball back. And then there's another way of defending, and that's m- m- keeping the ball and not letting the other team have the ball so they can't do anything against you. Modric and Huddlestone, what an unlikely pairing. People used to say, oh, my God, this is never going to work. 4-4-2, four, 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 two, two flying wingers, and Modric and Huddlestone in midfield, we're going to get torn apart. Nah, they were brilliant. We beat Chelsea, we beat Arsenal. Do you know what I mean? We just kept the football and it's just really important that people don't get carried away with this need for... I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying there's two ways. I still don't think we've uh, replaced Scotty Parker either, have we, Eddie? No, but... And, and Scott, sorry, and Scotty Parker's another uh, uh, one along the Palacios mode, along the uh, Sandra mode. I know very, you know, a lot shorter in stature, etc. but he was a little tiger and he got around and he got stuck in. But I still think, Andy, that Tottenham were at their best when they had two guys, two footballers in the central midfield that could keep it, that had a nice mixture of Always, Modric was always available. Little passes around the corner, could see a pass in any section of the pitch and was always there for a pass. And you had Huddlestone alongside him who could turn a a five-yard pass into a 35-yard pass, just like that. And that is the mixture that really, really made us a really good side and and, and got us into the Champions League. And so I just, I just, I really, you know, it's, important to to look at it and think there's two ways there's there's two ways to skin attack here we could go for an out and out defensive midfielder yes by all means you know but we could go the other way Bentaleb is such a lovely footballer if you stick another footballer alongside him teams are going to find it really difficult to get the ball off us and to me that's Tottenham yeah that to me that's Tottenham so you know we'll see what happens I guess Aidy my initial response to that would yeah. be when you had Huddleston and Modric who was behind them Dawson and King, two outstanding centre halves as a pair at that time. Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. our centre backs at the top or our centre backs now are nowhere near that near uh, that level. Uh, I mean, no one's going to be anywhere near King. Obviously, he was a Rolls Royce, but I think you know we've got a pair in there now, and and it, we 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 can if we can keep the ball better. Because talking about Mason. And I don't want to have a go at Mason, but he's, he's he, the number one culprit for giving the ball away in that central midfield. And if we just kept it a little bit better, we wouldn't come under so much pressure. I, I just I just think we could do it a different way. Certainly at home, Coxie. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we could yeah, play no, two I, footballers. Us, yeah. I we agree play... with that last week. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we could play two footballers in there. You know, we need a nice mixture because at the end of the day, like I said, you have to go and back the manager. But if we don't um, and we get a McCarthy... Um, then I agree with you, Coatsy. I don't think we will be any better than we were last season at all because I don't think McCarthy is the player that we need to take us on. Because let's face it, that's what we want, don't we? We want to be taken on a little bit. Whether that yeah, be, I don't, it, yeah. Whether that be in yeah, terms I, of position, Coatsy, or points, yeah, or, or play. just performance. Yeah, yeah exactly. Play. I don't think we should be selling to buy in like for like. No. You know, if we're selling and we're getting money in, then we should be trying to buy an advancement. And 
To be honest with you, I think McCarthy's decent. I've seen him obviously play for the Republic of Ireland quite a lot, and I've seen his performances with Wigan and Everton. And he does a job, but he's not a standout player. You know, you don't. Is he better hear... than what we've got? No, no, I don't, I don't think. He is, I, don't, no. I don't think but, he's. But classy, Mark, classy. Yeah, classy is definitely better. Than what I we've know. Got. It, classy would would bring a different passing range than anyone in our midfield right now. But next to Bentaleb, I, I think. I think McCarthy partners him better than anyone because if you look at the formation and, and what you're asking for of those two deep midfielders, is you look at the two box box midfielders who are who are complete players. <clears throat> and McCarthy is very similar to Bentaleb, just a few years progressed. I think, it, especially uh, physically, he's a little bit stronger than Bentaleb is. But I think they're very similar players. And when you have uh, you look at Southampton, just to take Pochettino's system and compare apples to apples. Schneiderlin and Wanyama are very similar players, with probably Schneiderlin a better passer, but it, it, they're two box-to-box midfielders who can do a little bit of everything. And McCarthy would bring that, and I don't think we currently have someone as well-rounded other than Bentaleb right now. I just if you look at if you look at Bentaleb and you look at McCarthy, their passing range is is quite low as well. You spoke about it earlier. They're short passing. Bentaleb is the same. You know, he gets the ball, he likes to release it. I don't necessarily, and I said it last week, I don't necessarily feel that we need to play with two anyway as a shield. If you get a good defensive midfielder and you can play with one and then let someone be a little bit more forward thinking, I just think if you've, if you've got those two who are short passing all the time, you need, you need something extra in front of them. And at the moment, I would question if we've got that game changer. You know that person, Ericsson, I think is the closest we've got to it. So it's finding probably a better role for him than we have done and giving him a bit more of the ball to be expressive if that's what you're going to do with someone like McCarthy. And... Can you see him stepping up to that next season, David? I think it's difficult. I think last season was inconsistent from him. I think some of that was because of his role in the team and I think some of that was because of his form. Um, I think Ericsson's got everything and I think there's a few players like Ericsson, I think Lamella, Next season, you know, we really need to see the best of them. But I think we need to give them the platform to do that as well. Yeah, we certainly do. And getting a proper defensive midfielder in, I I believe, with the players that we've got, because we're not going to be able to get another 10 in, sell another 10. So with the crux of the squad that we got, um, and I was disappointed that we, we didn't go in for Kabai, because I agree with AD and we spoke about it previously, that I think for the money, he was within our range and he had the basic passing ability that we needed but we didn't get him so I think for for the team that we've got defensive midfielder for me is a priority a box-to-box midfielder yes there's lots of I mean Morales was another one lads that was mentioned today um again once again that we've been linked with possible double deal there with with McCarthy we're running out of time but just very quickly lads going to come to each one of you if we could only make one more signing this summer toughly for you here only one more signing this summer who would you pick um let's go to AD first of all Oh God, that's going to be fast. Um, <laughs> I I think we need um, a little bit more up top, but I'm also aware that we're not going to get someone in that's going to be a, a world beater or a top class striker simply because of the Kane scenario. But I think we need a wide forward. I would take someone along the lines of Morales. I think that um, that they would be a good player, and then it would release maybe Chadley or Lamella to play in that, um, uh, you know, striker role, if if need be. Um, but I think we all agree that we need that Bentaleb partner. So, for me, it will be um, a central midfield player, a dominant central midfield player. And by dominant, I mean either dominant with the ball, i.e. unbelievably good passer, or dominant in strength. But we need someone to play alongside Bentaleb because... What we've got at the moment isn't good enough to take us where we want to go. Which is, uh, fingers crossed, the next level. Um, Coatsy. To be honest with you, I just I, I can't really disagree with what AD says. For me, it's the priority position. Um, that role, really. And to be honest with you, I don't I can't really pick anyone out. James McCarthy, as Mark has been talking about, is is uh, a player with a double deal with Morales that won't go away. For me, it is in terms of. Picking someone out, it's very difficult. I'm not a scout, you know, it's it's hard. But for me, it is more about the role. And for me, I've got real big concerns about up front. 
but as a priority, I would go for that that midfield partner with Benelab because that's the formation that it appears we're going to go into the season with again. Certainly does. Um, John, your priority this summer? I would agree with the other two. I, I, I really would like something in the centre of the park. Um, I, we missed out on two good ones. I can't think of any. You know, it'd have to be a left field signing somebody that we don't know of. I really, really would like. Um, I, I agree 100% with um, Ad and David. I think we need somebody there in that middle of the park. But who? Um, I'm not sure. I'm a little worried that we're going to not have a lot of pace up front. But it depends on what role he gives Ericsson. Yeah, do you know what? Mate, you just key. stole the words out of my mouth. I was just about to mention that pace um, for next season because last season it was something that that was a reoccurring theme in my mind. That just you just sit there watching it and it, it was very laboured, wasn't it? The play, our build up play, um, and it'd be lovely to get a bit of pace in the side um, and really go at teams, especially at home. You know, let's cut out this this overly defensive um, play and let's let's start having a go at home, you know, and making it um, a side a place that, that sides don't want to come and play at and, and get that pace back in the side. Um, last up, Mark, your your um, top priority signing for, for next season. Nobody gave names. Um, as, as always, <laughs> and, Cop out. And predict, predictably, I'd go Dutch. Um, I think as a central midfielder, I think Jordi Classy fits perfectly next to Bentaleb. He fits perfectly in a three-man midfield. Um, you know, he's he's just a classy, typical Tottenham player. Can play the ball anywhere. Can get stuck in. Just a fantastic player. And then up front, um, Victor Fisher from Ajax, who I know Andy likes. He's been playing number nine for Ajax towards the end of last year. Scores. You know, it's the Dutch league, so you can't take too much, um, put too much weight into it, but scores a, a very uh, good amount of goals as a winger there. Um, and he brings that, that little bit of flair. He's very very similar to Ericsson, maybe a little bit stronger than Ericsson is, but that deceptive quickness and, and very technical, you know, can play anywhere behind Kane or, or even interchange with Kane up top. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd love to see us go more attacking. I think Pochettino... If, if we're going to back Pochettino, we would hope that that his view is to to stabilise and then start to develop the side and, and then maybe hopefully get some of these, these more attacking players into the side because, you know, we've got some players who can do the business up up top. You've got um, Chad Lee, who... But I was about to ask, yeah. haven't we forgotten about um, Dembele? What happens to him? It's a good question. I mean, the rumours are that, that he's on his way out, lads. I, I mean, oh, well. John's mentioned there the, the uh, Dembele um, not getting a look in. Can you see him surviving the, the cold this summer? Yeah, he doesn't appear to be top of the list. To go out. I think there's others to go out before him. Um, if you believe what you read, obviously he's not happy that he didn't play as much as, as he thought he should have done last season and probably is... As much as we thought he should either, you know, I, I think we've all kind of agreed that, you know, that there was a place for him to get more games. For me, I'd be disappointed if he went. I do think he's a class player. I just don't know if, if Poch rates him. Um, I certainly do. I do think that some of it um, has also been down to him. I don't think he's shown the ability that he did at Fulham on a consistent basis, but... I just think when he's in full flow, he just makes such a difference for us. And I'd like him to stay, and I actually think he will. Yeah, he's got that, that strength, doesn't he? He can go past a man and, uh, you know, when he wants to, can unleash a shot. He doesn't score as many as he should. That's the uh, the big downside with Dembele. Listen, lads, we have we've could talk all night, I'm sure, but we've run out of time for another week. Don't forget, guys, if you're listening tonight, today, and, and uh, agree or disagree with with what's being said on the show with the lads out there get in touch just um tweet us on on twitter obviously at e underscore spurs our facebook we've got a new facebook page i should just mention um so if you followed or liked the old facebook page it's now e spurs page or one word just search for that on on facebook um and our instagram at e underscore spurs so get in touch guys it's all there for you and we want you to be part of the show and uh, and have your say we have as i say come to the end of another show for another week i can promise you that barring any any more gargantuan announcements that we will be back on sunday august the 2nd for a full preview of the the season and hopefully some more um ins by then um other than that guys have a great week have a great rest of your summer and come on you spurs Stop it all.